Good morning and welcome to this Wednesday, September 14th, 2022 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes featuring everything you need to know as you prepare for the trading day ahead. Well, uh, it's day two of inflation reports. Yesterday, of course, we saw inflation come in much higher than expected. The core CPI rose six tenths of 1% for August. The market was expecting three tenths of 1%. That means uh, the Fed almost uh, assuredly is going to raise at least 75 basis points. There are now some who think it's going to be 100. I would be shocked if it's 100. I don't think they're going to do that. But who knows? Um, I, that's one thing I really haven't predicted very well. And that's been the Fed and what they're going to do. Um, but I think it's going to probably be a 75 basis point hike. This morning, we got the August PPI out, and it was actually uh, a little better than expected. Headline number came in minus 0.1%, which was as expected. But the core PPI number for August actually rose two tenths of 1%. The market was expecting three tenths of 1%. So got a little bit of good news there. Futures, which had were, they were up overnight, then they went a little negative, and then the news came out, then they turned back to the positive side. Uh, let's see, the last, let me see if I can give you the latest on the diamonds and the spider and the QQQ. So right now, with about uh, 29 minutes to go to the market open, the spider, or excuse me, the diamonds, tra which track the Dow Jones Industrial, the diamonds up about one-tenth of 1%. The spider up uh, two-tenths of 1%. And the QQQ, which tracks the NASDAQ 100, is up about a quarter of 1%. So we are seeing a little bit of a rebound. But just to kind of put this in perspective, the QQQ lost $17 yesterday. This morning, it's up 74 cents. So I wouldn't... Uh, you know, wouldn't write home about these huge gains that we're seeing this morning, but it's better than red. So at least we got a decent PPI report. Maybe we can get a little bit of this back. Talked last night about Max Payne and the fact that there are now, you know, I thought beginning of the week, this was going to be a pretty boring Max Payne week because heading into the week, uh, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, if you looked at the spider and you looked at the QQQ, they suggested that Max Payne was pretty close to where the price finished last week. So a lot of times we go into the option expiration week with a little bit of a directional clue from the market, but we really didn't have that. But after yesterday, now we have it because with the QQQs and the spiders and the entire market being sold off so hard yesterday, now we've actually got the chance for a uh, recovery. So we'll see whether or not that uh, that happens or not. There's so much still coming out this week. Of course, tomorrow we've got retail sales, initial, initial jobless claims. I think sentiment's out on Friday. And of course, options expire Friday. Beginning of next week, I think Tuesday and Wednesday is our Fed meeting where they're likely to raise. Like I said, I think it's going to be 75 basis points. Some are now thinking maybe 100. Um, I don't know. I think 100 might, I don't know what, so hard to tell sometimes how the market's going to react. Um, you know, 100 might shock the market, then others, you know, may be that, hey, the Fed's going after inflation, so we feel better about things. And sometimes you get news like that, and the market goes up. It's really hard to tell. But uh, either way, we've got a lot of stuff coming up in the next week or so that uh, could impact the direction of both the bond and the stock market. So uh, we'll keep watching it and you know, watch it together and see what happens and be checking out some key support levels, which I'll be talking about here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, before we get into that, any of that, I know that uh, we did open the room just a little bit late this morning. So I'm giving everybody a couple minutes here to get in. But we'll go ahead and talk a little bit for those of you who are new to Earnings Beats. Just want to point out, as I always do, if you go to earningsbeats.com and you scroll down, you'll see an area where you can sign up for our free Earnings Beats Digest newsletter. Um, all it takes a name, email address. Hit that subscribe button, you're in. There's no credit card required. You can unsubscribe at any time. Um, it is a nice, I think it's a nice informative newsletter. Of course, I would think that because I write it. 
every day or every other day. Um, but Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we'll talk about things like earnings and gaps and relative strength. And it's a very quick read. Uh, I know everybody's bu really busy, but this is literally two paragraphs in a chart. Um, and the paragraphs, we're not talking about long paragraphs. I mean, if you go, if it takes you more than a couple minutes to go through the earnings beats digest, then you're probably distracted by something. It's a pretty quick read. Anyhow, if you go to earningsbeats.com, you scroll down, you can join in. I can tell you we have many, 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 many thousands of folks that uh, are subscribers here. Um, we have very high retention. Um, and I think there's a reason for it. I think it's a really good newsletter. It gives a lot of great information. For those of you who like to trade, I'm sure there are plenty of trading ideas. Just keep in mind those trading ideas are yours and yours alone. Uh, if you decide to trade, that's your risk. Uh, we just present the education, the possibilities, and you can uh, do with that what you would like. Um, let's go ahead and move on, talk a little bit about what happened yesterday. It was ugly, start to finish. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. Pre-market, market was higher. We actually looked like, you know, I'm, I was looking at the market from a position of cash and the market was up. I mean, heading into the CPI report yesterday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern, the uh, I think the NASDAQ was probably up, I don't know, maybe seven-tenths of 1%, maybe three-quarters of 1%, something like that. I know it was over 313, the QQQ was over 313, we finished at 293, just to show you what kind of massive reversal we had. But as soon as the CPI report came out, where it was double, where the core rate was double what was expected, everything turned uh, and went the other direction, went south. So uh, we ended up gapping down and then sold off all day long. It was a, it was a day very similar to the Jackson Hole um, talk that uh, Fed Chief Powell gave right here. You can see the Dow that day. And then of course, here's the Dow. If you look at the, uh, the QQQ, it was a little bit more gap. Still a lot of selling during the day. I'm not gonna try to sugarcoat it, but probably close to half of the move was at the opening bell on the, uh, on the NASDAQ. That was not the case from Jackson Hole. Remember that speech started at 10 o'clock in the morning. The stock market was already open. And so as soon as that speech came in, or you know, as soon as that speech started at 10 a.m., the selling began, and it was all day long. Selling yesterday also was all day long, but at least it was, um, you know, it did start with that big gap down at the open. Anyhow, all of the major indices, you can see we had climbed above the 20, the 50, things were starting to look pretty good. Even looked like maybe we were breaking this trend line. Lots of positives kind of similar to what re happened right before Jackson Hole. We turned up, took out the 20-day moving average, looked like we were getting ready to move up, and then right back down we went. So this does not look good. I'll be honest, September, historically, not a good month. Right now, technically, we're behind or beneath some key moving averages. Um, still got another Fed meeting to go. I can't see where we're going to get any great news coming from the Fed. So... What do you do? Well, I think outside of maybe options expiring, I think there could be could be potential for a little short term strength this just because of options. But other than that, I don't really see anything I like in the market right now. So if you do play the options trade and you are on the long side and you get a little bit of a pop going in toward the end of this week, I'd probably take it and run before the Fed meets next week. That would just be my my thinking. But we'll see how it all plays out and go from there. Uh, mid caps, small caps, I mean, across the board, you can see the selling. There was really no shelter anywhere. All 11 sectors, after all 11 sectors were up on Thursday and Friday, they all were swamped yesterday. Communication services, the worst of all of them, down 5.5%. And if you look, that I believe is a lower close than what we saw back in June. So communication services, one of those areas has not been a very good area of the market on a relative basis. And you can see on an absolute basis, looks like it's breaking down. So this is a group that clearly could use some strength. Technology, after going up and testing both moving averages, back down, getting close to the uh, lows that we saw at the beginning of the month. Still got a little ways to go to get down to that June low, but 
you know, you break below the early September low. And my guess is we're probably headed for that uh, June low. That would be my guess. Discretionary doing a little bit better. Still traded below the moving average. Actually, I held on to the 50. I thought it was below the 50, but it's two pennies above the 50-day moving average. So on a relative basis, consumer discretionary stocks doing better, which is maybe a little feather in the bull's cap. Uh, but I don't know that I would be, uh, again, writing home over uh, one signal. Real estate, weak. Industrials, weak. Everything kind of rolling over. So just wasn't a very good day yesterday. Uh, no way to sugarcoat that. The 10-year uh, treasury yield, watching this one closely right now, 3.42. We were up close to that 348 level. Today's high, 3.476. 3.483 was the high back on June 14th. So essentially we've gone back up and tested it now, but that move at 3.476 was prior to the PPI coming out. The PPI, like I said, came in a little bit less than expected at the core level. And that immediately sent some folks back into bonds, sending the yields back down from earlier today. Where do we finish today? Is the PPI really gonna have a big impact? throughout the trading day, or was it just an initial reaction? Well, we don't know. We'll know later today. What I would say, though, is that the market is probably going to continue to be spooked if we see interest rates, if we see the 10-year Treasury yield clear 3.483 and close there, I would be very careful with the stock market. And I'm somebody who believes the bottom's in, but it doesn't mean we don't go back and retest it. It could certainly happen. I don't think we're going to do that. But if we are, I believe it's going to happen over the next two to three weeks. So the timing is ripe. Um, historically, we know second half of September, not only is September the worst month, but the second half of September is much worse than the first half of September. So we've got to be careful. 10-year Treasury yield breaks out. I think that could trigger... Uh, possibly a tsunami of selling that takes out the S&P 500 3,900 level that we've been holding for a while. I don't think it holds if the yields break out. So watch that closely. All right, the S&P 500, I always like to start off this, this part of the show, this segment with uh, the S&P 500. And again, no way to sugarcoat, that was an ugly candle. We gave up both moving averages. The only thing we did differently than that uh, August 26th debacle from Jackson Hole is that we didn't lose the recent price support level, which is 3,900. And for those maybe who are, you know, not paying much attention, let me just point out 3,900 is kind of a big deal for a number of reasons. These lows back here in May, this reaction high, we went just a little above 3,900 at the end of June and tested 3,900 in July. Here was a big gap down from 3,900. Here was the run that we really made back at the begin, beginning of August, all started from a gap up from 3,921. So it was that 3,921 gap support all the way down to 3,900 that I've been watching closely. And if you remember, back at the beginning of September, we had sentiment, five-day moving average of the put-call ratio went up to 0.80 just as we were hitting 3,900 again. Major support, very, very bearish sentiment reading. That, in part at least, contributed to this big run back to the upside. And now here we are right back down at this 3,900 level again. Do we hold? Well, we got a little bit better news with inflation today. So we'll see. Close below 3,900, I would be careful intraday move below 3,900 with a close back above, and I would be much more bullish. So I do think that the odds are a little bit better on the bull side right now, just because we do have that second inflation report out of the way now. And we do now have a lot of in the money puts as we speed closer and closer to option expiration Friday. So I'm thinking that maybe we get a little bit of a rally, but I would be I would throw all of that out the window if we close below 3,900. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about here, you know, I don't know what everyone else does, what their morning routine is, but mine, when I wake up first thing in the morning, 
I have my cell phone next to me. I check futures. That's how boring my life is. That's what I do. First thing when I wake up, the phone goes on and I, of all places, go to CNBC to check out futures um, and just get a sense of what's going on, see if there's any headline news, like real news. Um, and then uh, usually roll back over, uh, hopefully go back to sleep if I can. But that's the first thing I do. And I saw I had, you know, some some email that some new email and one of them. I don't know. I always I probably have this set up this way. But anyway, Twitter sends me all these tweets and they come through my email and drive me crazy. And usually I just go swipe, 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 delete, 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 delete. Don't even pay attention to them because I don't. In this day and age of social media, first of all, news outlets aren't news outlets. They're opinion outlets. And Twitter is just I mean, it's like opinions on steroids. So I could care less about Twitter. I don't follow Twitter. Um, very, very little. But there was one that got my attention this morning. And it was from Sentiment Trader. And it, it was just a, you know, I love stats. I love research. And whether you agree with the numbers, whether they make sense for you, that's up to each individual. But it was a stat that showed that the yesterday, all 100 components of the NASDAQ 100 went down. And the stat was that over the last 25 years, there have only been 13 other occasions when, when that's happened, which I thought was, I mean, there've been a lot of really bad days. I'm thinking 13 doesn't seem like that many, but the first one that was showing on the list, and then of course I had to pull up the table. So needless to say, I didn't go back to sleep this morning. Um, I pulled up this table and I'm looking at it. And the first one was in 2008. So there were several, couple anyway, two, three, maybe in 2008, some more, a couple more in 2009, 2011, 12, maybe one in 2015, one in 2018, uh, 2020 with the pandemic. Um, and then yesterday. And so a couple things crossed my mind first. The, the first thing crossed my mind is why wouldn't the dot-com bubble have produced any days where all the NASDAQ 100 stocks went down. That just didn't, still does. I mean, I, I just can't believe that during the dot-com bubble when the NASDAQ lost 80% of its value over two and a half years, that there wasn't a single day in there where all 100 components went down. That was the first thing I thought of. But then the second thing, oh my gosh, I went down a rat hole and started reading all the replies. You know, all sentiment traders doing is just posting. And it was a table showing you know, should you sell after a day like yesterday? And they came back and they showed a table showing that these last 12 or 13 times that this has happened, what the S&P 500 did, or maybe it was what the NASDAQ did, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Over the next one week period, two week period, one month period, six month period, and one year period. And the point of this basically was just showing that the majority of the time the market was back up again in each of those time frames. And so I started reading these <laughs> responses and it wasted about 10 minutes of my life. Um, everybody criticizing the table. Now the table is just factual. I, I mean, I'm not verified. I didn't go back and verify the data. So when I say factual, I'm assuming that it's factual. But the responses were like, oh my gosh, this time is different. You know, 2008, we didn't have inflation like this. Well, true, but 2008, we almost had a financial collapse. Anybody who wants to compare to what we're going through right now to 2008 probably wasn't trading stocks in 2008, too early, late 2008, 2009. When Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, all that stuff was happening, I remember a conversation. I'm sorry to talk about all this, but I don't know, I kind of find it interesting. I was having a conversation with a really good friend of mine back in 2008. And I believe it was in September of 2008, right when things really started to turn down. And I remember we were having lunch together and he's the CFO for a really pretty good sized company. I don't know how many employees they had, but I would guess several hundred. Um, and we were talking about you know, the, the financial system and what was going on. 
And of course, you know, me taking the, the stock market approach and always having a little bit of a bullish bias, talking about some bullish things. I remember him talking to me back then and saying, you know, I don't know how you can even think any bullish thoughts right now. And I think back then it was actually options expiration. I think it was actually op options expiration week and the market had been getting killed. And I was bullish short term because of options expiration. That's what it was. And we were talking, he's like, I have no idea how you could be bullish about anything right now. He said, I've got payroll coming up next week. And I, he said, I don't know that we can access our line of credit to make payroll. That was back in September of 2008. Now, as it turned out, he, you know, the company was able to get access, but that's how bad it was back then. Imagine if the Fed hadn't stepped in and the market and bank system, banking system collapsed, you know what would happen to our currency? And I mean, everybody losing their jobs. I mean, it would have been absolutely a mess. And comparing what we're going through now versus what we went through then, and there were multiple tweets and responses that were just I'm not even, I don't know what the right word to say about it. So I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to be nice. But my point here is that things, people have gotten so bearish and they're always bearish and I don't understand it. And so what I have here on this chart on the S&P 500 is since 1950, 53, about 53 and a half percent of all trading days have been higher, which means 46 and a half have been lower. Now, call me crazy, but that tells me that the odds are in my favor. When I go to bed at night, the next day is going to be an up day. The odds are in my favor. Doesn't mean we're going higher, but the odds are in my favor. Look at the percentage of months since 1950. 60 over, just over 60% of all months have ended higher than they began. 75% of all years ended higher than they began. That's 54 out of the last 72 years. So when I see folks that always have a negative bias, I just think to these stats and I'm like, you're wrong most of the time. If you're going to be, if you're going to be negatively biased, you're going to be wrong. The Peter Schiff's of the world are going to be wrong a lot more than they're right. And I don't know how you make money with that kind of mindset. I mean, uh, I'm not a big fan of those who are always bullish either. And some of you might think I'm always bullish. I'm not. I do have a bullish bias. There's no doubt about that. But if I see things that, I mean, starting beginning of 2022, I don't know if I could have been any clearer. I was bearish. I was bearish through the first five months. It wasn't until June that I started turning a little bit more bullish or a lot more bullish. But I think just being on my point here is being on one side or the other all the time is not right. I mean, it's not appropriate. You have to be able to be somewhat objective about the market. And I still think the June low holds, but I think it's still very possible. If we lose 3,900, I think the odds are probably better than 50-50 that we're going back to test this low in June. I think this is a really big support area. But anyway, I just wanted to point that out for those of you maybe that don't follow the, uh, you know, the history of the market. We've had some really bad times. You know, folks are looking at the inflation now and saying, oh, do you, not, do you all not remember the 1970s? Please, this is not the 1970s. The market, if you just look at the way different asset classes are trading, this is nothing like the 1970s. I mean, I can find very few parallels between now and the 1970s. Other than the inflation starting to move up like it did in the early 70s, I see almost nothing the same. So enlighten me. Yes, this is a bad period. It's a bad year. Do you realize that, let me, let me read something to you. Do you realize that in 2019, the NASDAQ went up 35%? In 2020, even with the pandemic, the NASDAQ went up 43%. You know, in 2021, NASDAQ went up another 
The average return since 1971 on the NASDAQ, average annual return is 11%. 2019, we went up 35%. 2020, we went up 43%. 2021, we went up 21%. Don't you think we were due? The law of averages, weren't we, we were just due for a negative year, weren't we? Just to kind of bring the averages back down. We can't keep going at that rate. 35%, 43%, 21%. That was one of the things I talked about back at the beginning of the year. 2020, that, that period from March 23rd of 2020 to the beginning of January of 2022 was the biggest 21 and a half to 22 month return that we've had since 1950. No other period in history over the last 72 years anyway, have we seen that kind of move to the upside. So if you didn't look at anything else, just that, you should have been thinking, maybe the market's due for a pullback. Well, there were a lot of other signals as well, which I'm not gonna get into. My point here is, it is crazy how sentiment eight months ago, nine months ago, where we were and where we are now. Now, this is the worst thing ever. We are headed for the worst depression. I mean, just listen to the tweets, just read all the tweets out there. I'm sure they're all experts. This is horrible, market's awful. I mean, 10 year treasury yield at three and a half percent. Wow, that's brutal. Unemployment, 4%. Whew, I don't know how we're surviving this. It's been awful. Anyway, a lot of sarcasm in there. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. I'll show you the same chart here. <clears throat> so since 1971, the NASDAQ's gone up almost 56% of the time. If you just look at day to day, 56% of the days are up, meaning 44% of the days are down. 66% of the months have been up. Two out of every three months have been up. And then 74, almost 75% of the, oops, I said, typed in months, that should be years. 70, almost 75% of the years have been up. So what does all that mean? Well, it tells me my odds are much greater if I stay on the bullish side and just turn bearish periodically as opposed to the other way around or worse yet, always being bearish. And there are a lot of folks out there that always are looking at the negatives, always, and never look at the positives. There are a lot of folks right now that are flush with cash because of the low interest rates the last several years, their mortgage payments are down. Everybody making more money, jobs. Everybody, for the most part, has jobs. Now, has all that cheap money resulted in, some, in a spike in inflation? Sure. Yeah, it has. Fed's raising rates. I am in the camp that believes fairly shortly. I hate putting a time frame on it because I'm always... I always have to keep pushing it back. Maybe I'll ultimately be wrong. Maybe it'll never happen. But I do believe inflation's coming back down. I think it's going to come back down rapidly. And I think the attention will quickly turn to deflation and rates will drop and growth stocks will take off. That's what I see coming. I'm not changing my view. Now, one thing I will acknowledge right now is that is not the case. And I want to show you my sustainability ratios. We'll go ahead and wrap up the show with this. And we'll just look at the ratios as being my three you must see to end this show. But here's your S&P 500 this year. Here is the XLY versus the XLP this year. Of course, we bottomed in May, kind of put in a double bottom in late June, and now we've been rising. That's actually a good thing, even though the S&P has been going down. My favorite ratio continues to track fairly close to the high it set in, in August. So I think that is one positive I would take away right now, but there's plenty of negatives. I'm going to show them to you. The first is the QQQ versus the spider because that also bottomed in May, came up in June. So that was a good sign. Mark, money is rotating into more aggressive areas, but look at what's been happening, happening as the market's been going down. We've been moving back down in this ratio again. How about growth versus value at the large cap level? IWF, IWD. 
since the beginning of August coming down. Now we're not back at the June or May lows, so we still got room, but they're definitely trending down. That's much more bearish. I mean, it's telling me that this move to the downside is sustainable. The XLY, XLP, maybe giving me a little bit of a bullish hint there. So we'll just kind of keep an eye on that. But when I look at this, I'm like, well, why aren't all of them going down? Well, these two grow are, these are more growth versus value. I mean, this is definitely some growth. I mean, not all consumer discretionary is necessarily growth, but it is more growth than, than the XLP. That's for sure. Um, but when I looked at this, I put, put the 10-year 10, 10 treasury yield on this chart as well. Look at the 10-year treasury yield rising basically since when? The beginning of August. When have these ratios been going down? Beginning of August. I'm telling you, it's all about interest rates right now. And if I'm right longer term that rates come back down, I think we're going to see these ratios explode back to the upside. If I'm wrong, if the 10-year treasury yield keeps going up, 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 yeah, I mean, I don't see an explosion in the stock market happening. So it's going to come down to whether or not that call is right. That's why if the 10-year treasury yield breaks out above 3.48%, all bets are off for me. And I'm going to be just kind of watching things from the sidelines like I'm doing this week right now. You know, with these um, big economic reports coming out, these inflation reports, as I, you know, I think I wrote to members the other day, I said, you know, this is no time to be a hero. I mean, you could be a hero if the market all of a sudden explodes back higher, but you can also be a zero if we turn, you know, and head the other direction. So this right here needs to stop. This move up in the 10-year treasury yield, I think that's going to hold the key to what happens in the stock market. If we halt at 3.48%, if the better than expected PPI this morning halted the 10-year treasury yield in its tracks and we start trending back down, then I think we're holding 3,900 and we're going to go back up. If we break out in the 10-year treasury yield, I know I'm only looking at one, one thing, but I think this is one of the biggest ingredients of what we're going to have in the market for the next maybe month to several months. What happens with the 10-year treasury yield? Watch it closely. All right, let's get a quick look, see if the market is up, down, unchanged. Oh, we're slightly higher. Dow Jones up 46, S&P 500 up nine, NASDAQ up 30. So we're seeing a little bit of strength. Um, whether or not that continues into the close, we will find out. But you know, trend right now is lower. Do we hold on to 3,900? That's probably my biggest question heading into today and into the latter part of this week and even into the Fed meeting next week. Do we hold 3,900? I don't know. Tomorrow, I will be back over at Stock Charts TV for your next episode of Trading Places Live. Uh, that will be the recorded version. But uh, if you tune in over there at 9 a.m., click on this Stock Charts TV tab. Uh, you don't have to be a member at Stock Charts, by the way. Anyone who uh, just uses the website can come in and listen to the show. So that'll begin Thursday morning, 9 a.m. Everybody have a great day. Happy trading.